Hey, this is Brimstone. You're watching AFK away from the keyboard. Ain't no better place to be than right here watching now. This is Robert coming to you again with the AFK show again live from the Bulls Event Center here in Pflugerville, Texas. And we are now going to talk with Miss Stina Light. I pronounced it correctly. Yay. (laughs) Because crazy German spellings and their crazy pronunciations and their crazy Germanness. It's not really all that crazy. (laughs) L-E-I-C-H-T, Light. Y- yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's almost as bad as Gaelic and Welsh. Almost. <laughs> no comment. Because, like, you know, you know, like Gaelic, it's, you know, it's like, oh, my name's Kent, spelled A-R-Y-G-R-Y-T-W-X. You know, something like that. According to the to my teacher, I took Irish les- language lessons, and according to my teacher, a lot of the reason for that is because... The monks that translate that actually assigned letters to Irish were actually Latin speakers, and Latin actually has very little to do with Irish language yeah. itself. So, big difference. <laughs> I, I attempted, there are some that would argue that. Okay. I, I attempted to take Latin in college, and the the professor was. She was a good professor, but she kind of expected us to learn it all in, like, one night. Ouch. And so by, like, the third, it was a once-a-week class, and so basically by, like, the third week, she was expecting us to be fluent, and I'm like, we haven't even, like, learned the basics yet? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I I didn't last too long in that class, sadly. Mm. But I, I found it interesting in that in Latin, the, you don't really have grammar. Like, the, oh, the order of the sentences and stuff can kind of go however you want. It's kind of interesting. So you can talk like Yoda, and it's apparently not unusual. Huh. Or at least that's what I was told. I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I have a friend who's a classicist who would, might argue, but but I I don't know anything about Latin. So I, I will I'm let not. the Latin people battle it out. I, I, <laughs> my, my, my only Latin that I know is our, 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 our motto, Nerdus Vitas Supremus, and that's made up Latin, so... <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> so, anywho, Miss Stina Light, who, if you type in Stina, just Stina on Google, she's like the third person to pop up. That's me. I, I, I discovered that. She's going to tell us a little bit about her books that she has. And you have a new one coming out? Yes, I've got a new series coming out called um, The Malorm's Gates. The first book in the series is called Cold Iron. Um,. And it's an epic flintlock fantasy. Ooh. So, so kind of like like Dumas kind of flintlock fantasy, like swashbuckling. Or? Yes, some. Ooh, okay. More, more like, um, I guess probably sharps, rifles, or right. um, let's see, there's there's ships. So ships are fun. Yeah, like O'Brien, ships. you know. Okay. That kind okay. Of okay. Thing. I, I, I can get into that. Yeah, so it's it's like late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, hmm. It's a secondary world fantasy, so I'm not actually directly taking from history, but uh, I'm I like to steal from history. It's just yeah, you fun. Can, you gotta borrow <laughs> some real stuff here and there, throw it in, make you know, make it a little more interesting. Twist it up a little bit. Yeah, it's fine. It's- I'm a history geek. I just, I like history. Oh, yeah. I'm a bit of a history nerd myself. So, uh, me and Ken, or Ken's a pseudo-history nerd, and we'll have all kinds of fun 
his history debates and stuff and fun times. I uh, I'm more of a I go more up to about the Renaissance and that's kind of where I fade off. I, I'm more of the ancient history and Dark Ages is what I really really like. Wow. But I, I also like the I guess you know the 1600s. I, I really like the historical like the musketeers and all that well, the musketeers uh, are wonderful yeah i have and a friend who's in that, who's uh, that's her era that's she's a club into that like the the real the real d'artagnan and all that like reading up on those like those guys were just incredible at what they did dumas is awesome yeah I he really, really is like i've i've loved the the three musketeers ever since i was a little kid i've yeah it's definitely one of my favorite books when Always one of my favorite movies when it, they, whenever they come out with even the weird steampunky one that came out a couple of years ago, which it's slowly growing on me more I watch it. Then again, that that airship is just awesome. So <laughs> you gotta you gotta love an airship. It's good stuff. And anyway, because oh. I like sword fights, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love sword <laughs> fights too. I took I took. Uh, a lot of fencing, so Ooh. I like like sword fights. But uh, this series, I didn't t- tell you about this series. This, this series. series is uh, The Fae and the Fallen, um, which starts with Of Blood and Honey. Of the blood and I just I love that title, Of and Blood and Honey. And we'll hold it up for the camera. <laughs> the elevator pitch for that one is basically um, the main character is, his name is Liam. He's a Catholic who was born in Derry, or London Derry slash Derry, um, and his, he thinks that his father was a Protestant that got his mother pregnant and then vanished, but hmm. then really his father is Bran of the Fianna, Ooh. and it, he is part, he's half Puka, which Pukas are shapeshifters. Um, if anybody's seen um, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Harvey, mm-hmm. I love that movie. Um, so because they're shapeshifters and they're very, very dark. And uh, Aren't so they this half shapeshifter doesn't know it, gets pulled into the troubles, becomes a wheelman for an IRA bank robbing unit, and then everything goes horribly awry. Sounds like fun. <laughs> and weren't weren't the puka also in Scotland? Weren't they the the water horse? I think where the they, horse is one of their forms. One yeah, of the things that they you, do is they you, go for a wild yeah, the ride or get a on wild them, ride. They, yeah, they they you can't get off, and they jump into a lake or a river, and they uh-huh. take you under, and they drown you. And that happens, except in a car. Nice, <laughs> but not in the water. <laughs> Interesting. So that, that definitely sounds interesting. A, a nice mix of Celtic mythology and kind of a urban setting. Yeah. Um, kind of an urban fantasy type thing. Yeah. Um, in the vein of like Charles de Lint and that sort of thing. Um, cool. Less Anita Blake. I'm, I'm more familiar with Anita Blake and Jim Butcher and all that, but... But it, it sounds really interesting. I, I'm, I actually am intrigued by that. I, that the, I'm actually tempted to pick this up <laughs> and read it. And then we have, what is this, book two? Book two and Blue Skies for Pain. And again, for the camera. Ta-da. Northern Ireland in 1977. Yeah, because that, that wasn't a, a sketchy situation just right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, you don't want to give away all of the plots. So, no, you know. no. So, if this sounds interesting, if you like mythology and a bit of history mixed together, sounds cool. So, uh, obviously, you have quite a bit of interest in Irish culture, Irish mythology, Irish history. Uh, and American history. And American yeah. history. Uh, what, what were some of the things that sparked that interest when you were younger? <sighs> um, actually... What started that series is a book called Those Are Real Bullets. It's a nonfiction book. It was written by two English reporters who were present when uh, Bloody Sunday in 1972, January 1972, happened. Um, they wrote the book because the British came out with a different idea of, of events, and, uh, officially. 
and then they decided they wanted to publish their experiences and as witnesses. And so we know after the second investigation, uh, they officially apologized and exonerated everyone. They'd originally <coughs> said we're terrorists, that whole thing. So um, that book was what started it all. And actually, I started writing it before, started writing of Bud and Honey before that report came out. So um, it was just really fascinating. I was also watching at that time what was going on. George Bush was president at the time when I started mm-hmm. writing. Um, and I saw a lot of similarities between what was happening then, the great political divide, um, two sides getting more and more intense. And I saw what happened in Northern Ireland, and I felt like if we're not careful, we would go that direction. So for me, a lot of it had to do with talking to Americans and saying, hey, we really need to be more careful. Um, Debate doesn't have to be so one-sided and so intense and emotional we can just we can talk about issues it's important to have viewpoints from all different sides um, because that's I think with creativity it's really important to have a broader view of things and to have more exposure to different ways of looking at things and that's I just don't feel like there's just one answer to everything Right. Yeah, there so. generally never is. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> that's not very geeky, I guess. <laughs> we can't be geeky all the time, as much as we would love to be. I feel like I'm being so serious. <laughs> Why <are you> so serious? <laughs> yeah, I can't do Heath Ledger. I never could. I'm I sorry. I'm sorry. I I I, I can't do a good joker. <sighs> but we were talking earlier the history nerd between us. Um, like for me, like one thing that really got me into like medieval history was when I was growing up. I read a lot of like King Arthur myth, you know, the King Arthur stories. Sure. Um, read a lot of Greek mythology, I Roman mythology. So you, same kind of background. Oh yeah, I'm a total Tolkien geek. Oh yeah. Um, in fact, I just came back from a trip to England and Northern Ireland and Ireland. And I actually got to go to the Eagle and Child, um, which is where Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, that's where their writing group met. Nice. Bit jealous of that. It was so awesome. (laughs) A friend of mine actually just recently got back from a semester in Oxford. And so she was over there first and she got to go to a lot of places I didn't get to go to when I was over there. And yeah. like, she went to like Avesbury and all this and I'm like, not fair. Yeah. So. Oxford <sighs> is gorgeous. Yeah, it really is. It's a great town. Um, it was kind of a little scary when we were there, we were like outside this little movie theater and, uh, there was like one of the old Tudor buildings had caught on fire and like the fire department's all going, but they, they got it out pretty quick. So, wow. I guess that's a risky take living in a 500 year old, <laughs> 500 year old building. Well, the interesting part, well, one of the interesting parts, there, there were many, many, many interesting parts, uh, was having a conversation with someone who had went to school in Cambridge, my friend Carrie, she went to school at Cambridge and they weren't, set up for women at the Hmm. school. So um, bathrooms were an interesting thing, particularly since they were largely medieval buildings that didn't have sufficient heat, and then they would have to, like, leave the building entirely for another building if they wanted to take a shower or go to the bathroom or anything like that, no matter what the time of night it was. Yeah, those castles can be a bit drafty. <laughs> we uh, um, went to several castles when I was over there. I think my favorite was Carnarvon. I don't know if you've ever been there up in North Wales. It's right on the coast, on a, you know, so it's right across the the water from Anglesey, mm-hmm. and it's like oh, it's just huge. And it was uh, 
one of the old Norman castles. So he's it's like, ah, oh. but it's all now it's all in, it's slowly falling apart, but you can still like run up on the ramparts and go up in the towers and uh, it's fun times. It cracked me up how many times I heard, oh, that's the new building. When was it built? Oh, 1783. Right. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. <laughs> uh, fun times. So, back to writing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I know that we could probably go on about history all day. But, you know, you're an author, so we should probably talk about some writing. So, what what were some of your uh, inspiration, like some of your favorite authors growing up that kind of inspired you to Ooh. get into writing? Ursula Le Guin was one. Um, I really like her. I'm a huge Ray Bradbury fan. Um, also, uh, I read a lot of, um, Zilpha Keekly Snyder as a kid. She was amazing. Um, I don't know if you've heard of her. Uh, I don't recognize the name. She wrote this really great book called, uh, The Witch's Worm, hmm. which is about the Salem witch trials. It's about this cat that's haunted by the ghost of someone from the yeah, interesting. and this little girl finds the cat, and it's all these interesting things happen. It's neat. It's very spooky. <laughs> um, so there was, let's see, Sylvia Kiki Snyder. Um, I did like Heinlein um, up to a point. I, I do like science fiction a great deal. Stephen King is one of my favorite writers ever. Shirley Jackson, who wrote The Lottery and The Haunting of Hill House. Um, yeah. Those are some of my favorites. I could go on yeah. for like ever, <laughs> but I don't want to do that. I've noticing a trend, kind of a lot of creepy, tr- creepy stuff, and then yes. you write like, a lot of creepy stuff. So, nah, no influence whatsoever there. I like it. <laughs> so yes, yes, there's a lot of creepy stuff. So when when did you start writing? When did I start writing? Um, well, with the intent to be a writer for real, um, probably 2001. I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was a little kid, and I dabbled in it quite a bit. Uh, Started my first novel when I was in seventh grade, but that doesn't really count. Yeah, I guess I can relate. I, I came up with my first idea for like a, a fantasy novel in probably about seventh or eighth grade, and eh, it's still not finished. But <laughs> I still use the characters in my D and D games, though, so they're still alive. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and actually, uh, it's evolved to the point now where one of my characters is actually the grandson of one of the original characters. Oh, nice. Because uh, we started a uh, the new 5th edition campaign, so I had to come up with a new character. So right. I'm like, well, pull out these old character ideas. Uh, eh, we'll skip ahead a couple hundred years, and he's the he's an elf. So, you know, you can do 600 years between generations. Sure, why not? <laughs> well, my husband and I still play D&D. Ah... Uh, So have you done many cons before? Or is this oh, yeah, mostly literary cons. And I've, I've been to Comic Palooza before mm-hmm. um, last year. I attended last year. And it, I think it's a really good con. It is. It's, it's a good one. It's uh, definitely one of the biggest ones in the state. And uh, always has tons and tons and tons of stuff going on. Uh, it's kind of kind of sad for us because we miss a lot of it because we're always filming stuff. But... The sacrifices we make for you, for you, and you, and that camera that can't see me. And so, but that's okay. I, I, I if, if I get at least an hour or two to be able to walk around and see all the nerdy stuff and some of the, the costumes and stuff. Costumes I, are you know, always great. The stuff I can't afford to buy. And, yeah. You know, but yeah, that was one thing I've always loved about. Uh, conventions ever since my very first one was just the costumes. I always love seeing like all of the, you know, 
the especially like the ones that are like just so detailed it's like you don't get yeah, costumes like, at literary conventions very much but um you definitely i, I don't, it's uh i like comic con, comic palooza sorry uh, <laughs> whoops i like comic palooza for the costumes that that because the detail is just amazing how much people put into those and it's it's fun. it's fun. Yeah, one of my uh I was telling you about how my my Wrath of Khan badge, I got that my first con that I went to before we started and uh one of the guys that I met at that con, he was in the Wrath of Khan uniform, you know, the maroon nice. uniform. And then I mean, he looked like he stepped off the set. That's great. I mean, it was like the the you know, exact same material and the only difference that he had made was he he was either like a captain or an admiral, mm-hmm. and so he was wearing a dress sword. Oh. So he had added like a like a rapier, nice to a, to his uh, costume, and then I was like, that's just like the perfect touch. And it's like, it's like that's really nice. I Wrath of Khan kind of uh, it's it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I love that that era, and it's like Star Trek, and it's like that's definitely my favorite of all the the Starfleet uniforms. I think it's great for the officers, you know, kind of makes them look looks like officers, you know. It's like they shouldn't be in a duty uniform like everyone else, you know. That's my opinion, but yeah, it's like we're in charge. We should look nice. I like it. Yeah, I actually uh, Uhura is the reason I got involved in science fiction, frankly. Hmm. Um, I was very small when they 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 aired the episode with the first interracial kiss on mm-hmm. television, and I remember I remember how shocked everyone was. Um, it was just such a big hairy deal, and it was at that moment that I I realized, ooh, this is really cool because this is something that could change the world in a positive way. And that's one of the reasons why I've always been into science fiction and fantasy because I feel like it's I feel like it's important. I mean, sure, that's, there's the fun part where mm-hmm. everything is just for laughs and and things blow up and it's a kick. That's great. But I feel like the really important work that science fiction and fantasy does is when it's making commentary on what's going on in the world mm-hmm. today. Um, and what's what's going on? What are the things that we really need to think about? I mean, it doesn't provide the answers, but it provides the questions for the people who one day will come up with the answers. I used to work at Motorola, and I promise you that they were thinking of Star Trek when they made those flip phones. Um, and I think that's wonderful. I think mm-hmm. that's wonderful. And so, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like um, I mean, just the Star Trek alone. I mean, f- cell phones, laptops, the MP3, the audio files that came from an episode of Next Generation where Data was listening to like eight operas at one time. Sure. And at that time, it, and even before that, iPads. Yeah. Um, if you look at the original show, they're mm-hmm. using something that looks like an iPad. Yeah. iPad. Yeah, and it's like all that stuff, it, sliding doors, is all, it's all from Star Trek. And that's just one sci-fi, sure. you know, genre, you know, it's like, and then um, you look at like Star Wars, like the, the the mechanical arm that Luke gets or that Anakin gets, and you know, and they say now we're only maybe 15 or 20 years away from something of that detail. Sure. And it's like, you know, something to aspire to. It's really exciting, I think. And also another, like, kind of what you were saying, like, the social commentary. So like even going back to, like, the Greek mythologies, you know, it they they tell us, you know, things that we can aspire to. It also gives us warnings of what not to be and what, you know, how Sure. Not, you know, it's like, look at all the, the tragedies, you know, the people who, that the, their hubris and their greed consume their lives. And, and, I mean, well, that's, you know, everywhere, but it's like... It's something to think about, I think. And I just, I don't know, I just, I, it, it's a positive thing to think about issues and situations from all different angles for that reason. Uh, if you just stick with, like, the one answer, then you can't foresee that there might be trouble or 
in the future, near future, or whatever. You can't. It makes it. It makes people less flexible, and less less able to adapt. Um, and we need we need that ability to adapt and change and grow because stagnation is death, really. <laughs> Here I go again, being serious. <laughs> i got to stop that. <laughs> stagnation died. Well, speaking of changing and growing and expanding, you, you touched on your new book a little bit. Yeah. Uh, when, when will that be out? That's going to be out um, in July, at the end of July. July. Cool, cool. And that will be available at like booksellers or on Amazon oh, or Amazon everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere is good. People and even maybe Fifth Dimension Books, which is this little bookmobile in Austin, oh, Texas. Yes. <laughs> Is is that like the like the old school bookmobiles like back in the day when we were kids? Is, so it's it was, an old school bookmobile with nothing but science fiction and fantasy in it. I like sorry, I like plugging for independent bookstores. Yeah. We're, we're all we're all about the the, the shameless plugs. Okay. So plug away, plug away. So I want to put a shameless plug in for them, and I also want to put a shameless plug in for book people. So. Book people is a fun store. I've been there not recently, but I've been there many, many, many times. I, I, now that I live more south again, I can probably start going there again more. <laughs> it's a great bookstore. I love it. It really is. I, I I had a friend in college, and we go there all the time. And it's like, you just go there one day, and you never know. It's like there's always some uh, author doing a book signing or doing a lecture or something. And it's like... I hear voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, uh, and you'll have a booth at Comic Palooza, or mm, no? No, just wandering around. No, I, I'll be on panels. Okay, on panels. So, uh, will you be doing like any kind of a book signing going on, or do you, do you it know? Looks, it looks like just panels. Just panels. Okay. Well, but I you have, know, if somebody no. has one of my books and wants me to sign it for them, I'm happy to do it. As long as I'm not running to a panel. Yeah, that, that's never good. Yeah. Yeah, it's always fun when you're trying to get somewhere and people are like, hey, wait, wait, and it's like, I can't, gotta go. But we understand. We understand. It happens. So you can see Miss Stina Light, and I'm still pronouncing it right. You're still pronouncing it right. (laughs) Again, at Comic Palooza this upcoming weekend down at Houston at the uh, George R. Brown Conference Center. And the voices in my head totally didn't help me remember that at all. I did that all on my own. And we have uh, more coming up later. We still got the returners coming. They're going to be performing with for us as well as talking with us a little bit about their music. So make sure you click like and subscribe and tell everyone uh, about all of our uh, follow all of our uh, social media and YouTube, and you can find all of Miss Light's books at all the bookstores and on Amazon. I'm guessing, and so, so stay tuned. We have plenty more to come.